And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm excited to talk to Richard Barr because uh, he's right now with me in my studio. So now would be a perfect time to uh, do that. We're going to talk today about service as a discipline. And Richard is a guy who is all about service. Uh, he's been a lifelong resident here in the Twin Cities, but boy, does he have a passion for service. And he's written a couple books on top of it. One is called Amazed, Why the Humanity of Jesus Matters, and Those People, the True Character of the Homeless. And Richard, always nice to see you, and thanks for coming and being part of the show today. Well, as I told you offline, Bill, I mean, I appreciate the generosity of you and Rosie allowing <laughs> me to come on the show. I think it's great. I always love the conversations. Yeah, it is. And we're always thinking around Thanksgiving time, what are we doing for others? How are we serving others? And you're, uh, you serve year round. So this is what you do. And I love your passion for the homeless and your passion for coming alongside the people sort of on the fringe of society. But well, let's, let's talk today about service as a discipline. Yeah. So I just, you know, I think this is a perfect time of the year to have this conversation because um, a lot of people turn to be thinking about those in need. People are looking for places to serve. You know, I, I get countless asks like, uh, hey, I'd like my kids to serve in a soup kitchen, which I'm still trying to figure out what a soup kitchen is. But <laughs> but people have this illusion that there's soup kitchens around and that we want to bring our kids to them and, and show them how good they have it. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Te- teach them what to serve. But but but. It, the 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 root of that is some sort of a desire in us to try to reach out and and to bless others in the way that we've been blessed and so I, I so I take those questions serious and then those are this is a great time of the year for somebody to kind of maybe put their training wheels on and and step in to try to serve. So just because you haven't been on the show in a while and we have tons of new listeners, uh, give the uh, the listeners a little bit of a snippet into. Uh, your most recent book, which was Those People, The True Character of the Homeless. So that is a character study of friends of mine. I think there's about two dozen friends of mine in the book that have uh, amazing and deep character. And it was kind of my memorializing my observations about them and and my appreciation for who they are. Um, It was something I kind of woke up to Mm -hmm. as I'm dealing with people, and I I realized that, man, there's some people with some really great deep faith and people that really, really know how to be unselfish and know how to love, uh, generous, that are um, uh, have great tenacity, Mm -hmm. and just started kind of putting these stories together and then kind of examining myself and, quite frankly, where I fall short in really all of those things, and I think it's unexpected. You know, we don't see somebody in the homeless community and think about their character and, and the, and the best things about them. But, um, story after story in this book are people that I I've come to know and I come to love and, and appreciate and respect. And so I just wanted to share those stories with other people and maybe in some way break down the paradigm about who we might think the homeless are and probably the bigger lesson behind it is, is that how we judge other people. It's the yeah. old book by its cover, right? Yeah. And you are the kind of person, rare, I think, you will break patterns and you will be in your car and you'll pull up to a corner and there'll be a homeless person. Not only will you connect with them, look them in the eye, uh, talk to them and give them something, but you will start a relationship. And if you're back the next day, you now know that person's name And it could be that three or four weeks later, he's sitting at your table at Thanksgiving in your home. That's amazing stuff. So, uh, yeah, that is a chain of events. That's a real thing. I know. Let's just be clear that that's like kind of uncommon, but it has actually happened. Has actually, yeah, Yeah. has actually happened, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so your love for the uh, peoples on the fringe, a lot of people get very nervous. You know, if they see someone approaching them for money, uh, everybody freaks out, and the question they want to ask is, what should I do? They're just going to use it for drugs. Yeah, and so I was just asked that question this morning at an engagement that we had, like, what, how do I deal with panhandlers? And so my recommendation was to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and you being the, the, the panhandler right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 My hand on. Yeah. yeah, so we do talk about in the book some tips about dealing with panhandlers. Well, I want but- a free one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to buy the book. <laughs> I mean, my listeners can, but I'm not. <laughs> you, I host a radio show. You should give yeah, me the book. I should just answer that question. Yeah. So, um, it, 
dealing with panhandlers or homeless or or people that are in those kind of vulnerable spots, I think it's a very individualistic thing mm-hmm. in terms of our approach. And I think we have to really seek the promptings of the Holy Spirit to determine what we should step in. I have lots of women that say to me, there is no way I'm ever going to roll my window down and give anything to anybody. And I would never urge that person to I do wouldn't that. either. However, however, because, let's just say she, because she even asked me that question, it means that she's being prompted to step into something. Mm. So then the question is, what is she called to step into? So to use that as a prompting to, to take action and to move <laughs> Mm-hmm. Richard Barr is my guest. You can learn more about him at Richard Barr, B-A-H-R dot com. Let's get back to uh, service as a discipline. Speak about that, Richard. <laughs> that would be my time to speak. Yeah, I think it you would know, be. I was, I, was, I was reading, you know, I was, I was revisiting a, a book, The Spirit of Disciplines by Dallas Willard, and um, there's, I think, seven disciplines in there, and service is one of them. And I was, I was contemplating that as I was thinking about this show, and I was thinking about, he talks about... Um, talks about conversion versus transformation mm-hmm. in the book. Conversion versus transformation. I think there's a real parallel there between probably justification and sanctification, right? And and um uh there's a there's an example about how when we get when we get married, uh, you know, years and years later, we're still married. Like we're still married, right? Just like when we decide to follow Jesus, we commit our lives, we can confess our faith. You know, we're justified, so we're we're we enter into God's kingdom, into that grace, and and yet in our marriage, it's the investment in that marriage, it's the acts, it's the things that we do in it that really make it a rich relationship. So, I think that that's the the transformational part that we seek is that we step into any of the spiritual disciplines, not just service, but if we're speaking about service today, it's actually the acts in those things that really enrich our relationship. Mm, I like that a lot. So it's not that we have to do things. We get to do things. Yeah. We're not trying to earn anything. We're trying to um, bear fruit. So I was looking up, so I know that, and I know that some listeners are, everybody's in different places in faith. So some of this might be kind of geeky, weird stuff, but like Martin Luther, how he didn't love the book of James and Mm -hmm. the whole faith without works. And he gets kind of a rap on that. Like, like, and because Luther was really a big grace guy, right? I mean, that's in and, and he the, the the what he was coming out of, uh, he saw grace as being a key element. But I actually found a quote by Luther that was very interesting. That's that he said. Um, uh, he said that it's impossible to separate the burning and the shining from a fire. Ooh, I have to think about that one. And I. So I haven't I didn't dig further than that, but I thought that kind of changed my whole thinking about Luther and this whole rap that he gets about about you know faith without works is dead. That's the big that's probably the key verse that mm-hmm. he would have taken issue with. But yet the same person apparently said it's impossible to separate burning and shining from a fire. Mm-hmm. So it's really it's the faith that leads us to works. And before I I I faithfully followed Jesus, I unfortunately. Uh, understood some bad theology where, I mean, I was an addict. I mean, I had a lot of things going on in my life and I felt like I needed to clean myself up. I needed to get better before I would be worthy. And I just wonder how many people are still out there that don't understand the truth about that. And so it wasn't until I was broken down and finally surrendered, you know, where I made that decision, made that commitment that then God began to activate in my life. So I, I had those things backwards for a long time, and it just breaks my heart to think that there are still people that don't understand that. Mm-hmm. Richard, if you would talk further about this being surrendered idea. I know this is something we hear often, but how do you how did you walk that out? I yes. know it's a big question. It, yeah, yeah. Is this a three-hour show today? Two-hour show. Two-hour show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if this next answer doesn't go well, I'm going to cut it down yeah, to 30 right. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So surrender. So I'm 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 active in the recovery circles, and I know so that. that's a big word that it we is use is surrender, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that gets flung I, around a lot. Yeah. So, I've got George Fraser on after you. Yeah. Oh. Today. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. So we'll talk I'm about sorry, it. I'm sure. sorry to hear that. Oh, I get Hi, it. I get Hi, it. Thank you for your sympathy. <laughs> Be nice to see you again, George. Um, yeah, so I I initially surrendered to drugs and alcohol and uh, entered 
recovery, some traditional recovery programs and was able to be clean. Um, but what I wasn't was I wasn't free. Mm-hmm. And so there turned out to be a, about a 15 year gap in figuring that out. So I was surrendered to uh, the probably the most prevalent and damaging thing in my life, but just not. I, so I always tell people to recovery meetings. The only thing God wants from us is everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I hadn't, I wasn't willing to give him everything. And so it wasn't until another crisis in my life, 15 years into recovery in quotes that, uh, I needed to make that complete surrender. And that's when things really, really begin to change for me. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I I love this story because I love stories of transformation and tell me more. So I began to go to a church. I uh, got married to my current beautiful wife, Carla, and was in a men's Bible study. So I'm trying to walk out some of these disciplines, uh-huh. not knowing what I was doing, but trying to trying to add things to my life, trying to get rid of the bad and replace it with the better. And how things happened was about 2000, I don't know, five. There were several things. I mean, my the business that I had tanked and we had, ran out of cash and didn't have any money and didn't know what we were going to do. And that was a crisis of faith for me to surrender my business to God and to trust my finances to God. And that's when we began to tithe was immediately after that. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2007 or eight, a friend of mine that was serving oatmeal and grits out of the back of his van on Curry Avenue, downtown Minneapolis, outside the Salvation Army, needed some help and I stepped in to join him. And so now that's a full fledged ministry that's been running for 14 years that serves the homeless every single day. I still have an open invite to both of you to come at four 30 in the morning to yeah. serve with us. Awkward pause. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I'm, I'm up but, anyway. Yeah. 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 But, but the Dog, point is, I'd is be that happy to come. We, we literally, we literally have dedicated teams uh, seven teams that serve each a day of the week. I know. It's are, an amazing ministry. Yeah, it, that all it, started out of this little... It's amazing that God has provided no for this all these years. Kidding. I mean, it is not us. I mean, there's no way that it's us. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I think I'm going to take a little break and then come back, and I want to hear more of the details of that, because I think it's a fascinating story, and I don't care what Rosie thinks. You know, I really... <laughs> She's giving me... The, the look right now. Just go to break, Bill. All right. All right. We'll be right back. Richard Barr is my guest. You can learn more about Richard at richardbarr.com. He's the author of the book Amazed and also the author of Those People, the True Character of the Homeless. We'll be right back. Faith Radio and Afternoons with Bill podcasts are available because of listener support. If you are a supporter, thank you so much. Becoming a supporter today by visiting MyFaithRadio.com. Let's get serious about service. What a great time to talk about it as we are faced with this wonderful Thanksgiving holiday coming up next week. And acts of service is a discipline. My guest is Richard Barr. He's authored a couple of books, but more importantly, he is a man of service. And he has personally delivered over 30,000 pairs of socks to friends on the street. And he's met the homeless. He's learned their names. He established his relationship with them. And he spends evenings in homeless shelters and other places where Homeless people may hang out. He connects with them. He encourages them, helping them to meet not only their basic needs, but he also tells them about the hope that he has in Jesus. So, Richard, let's talk about how we do, how do we flip the switch from maybe a, a one-and-done kind of volunteer event to something that's a part of who you are and what you do. So one of my roles is to I orient our new volunteers that come <clears throat> down to our breakfast. And first of all, somebody that is willing to get up and to head to a city, so I'm near Minneapolis. So to come to downtown Minneapolis uh, at 4:30 in the morning, they already have some degree of dedication slash insanity <laughs> already, right? So, yeah. um, so there's already something stirring in them to do something of some significance. And I always ask them one question after our their shift finishes, and I ask them if anything 
what surprised them. And uh, the reason I asked the question is that I already know the answer. Uh, and so the typical answer would be something along the lines of people are more gracious than I thought they'd be. People were like way more thankful than I would have thought they would be, which is always very interesting to me. It's like, so why do we put on the homeless that they would be anything other than gracious and thankful? Like, why would we do that? So that's probably another show. I don't know. But yeah, we think of them as needy. Yeah. And and needy people are just needy. Yeah. Needy and whiny. And yeah. Whatever. Right. And, and does that happen? Absolutely does, but yeah. I've seen that happen in retail environments. Me too. You know, so yeah. yeah. Um, and then I ask them, I invite them to come back, and so I get one of two responses. I either get um, kind of a blank stare, like "Yeah, sure, right, yeah, I'll be back," which means I will not be back. Kind of like how um, I said to you, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kind of <laughs> like, you're like, yeah, I'd love to come yeah, down I'd love sometime. To. My eyes got all bugged yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, okay. right, insincerely. So, <laughs> or the other response would be, uh, no, I don't need to think about it. Like, what day do you need help? Oh, wow. I mean, it's literally, it's that polarizing. And so I think when, I think there's a process of almost maybe experimentation, like to not be discouraged, like uh, think Thank God that he does place the burden to serve different people groups on people's hearts. Like I've got several friends that uh, adopt kids uh, in our small group right now. There's a couple that's attempting to adopt a kid from, uh, I forget what country, but some somewhere in what we would call the former Eastern Bloc, right? And um, I look at them and I'm like, I have no idea why you'd want to, I mean, thank you for that, but mm -hmm. not my jam like forever. And He's like, I would so much rather adopt this kid than serve breakfast with you in the morning, right? <laughs> so, so we have this different burden and yeah. different different skills, and so sometimes it takes us a bit of time to kind of figure out what that is. And when we do, I think that's the point where we need to flip that switch and we need to decide, okay, so God's placed this burden on my heart, and I feel like I'm really equipped and to step into this thing. And so, what kind of commitment am I going to make? You know, how am I going to exercise what I've just discovered about myself? I love that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Richard Barr is my guest, and we are talking about uh, having a uh, a spirit of discipline and having service be a discipline. And I appreciate our, Richard our conversation about the the switch flipping. Um, I love the person that says, well, "Fine, I'll be back. What day do you need me?" And I think that is a, a kind of a confirmation that that the Holy Spirit is nudging you saying, I think you found a ministry to be a part of for a time being. Yeah, so I, I was I thought of another analogy driving over, and it's one that I stole from a recovery meeting I heard not that long ago. So the guy got up and he said, you know, I've been to jail. I've been to jail many times. And he says, I never once went to jail for what I thought. He said, I only went to jail for what I did. Mm, I right? like it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I think about... Um, Boy, just about everybody probably within our voices right now either has served or has been involved in service or certainly has contemplated, thought about, desired, planned. Um, and when I'm talking about serving, I'm talking about f finding the, the, the thing that causes you that ache. You know, Bill, you've got yours. You know, I, I know a little bit about what you ministry you step into. And, and so it just gives you that ache like it's almost like I need to do this. I Absolutely. need to be part of this, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so to identify that that vulnerable people group where there's that need and and to move towards that because it's we can think about it, but what we really need to do is we need to act and step into it. And that's what becomes transformational. And none of us that serve faithfully on a regular basis do it for our own benefit, but we'll all say the same thing mm -hmm. that, I mean, God's grace has washed over us and has given us so much more than we could possibly have ever given. Yeah. Richard, what are some of the uh, transformational things you've seen happen in your life as a result of uh, years and years and years of service? Well, I would, I, I like to say that uh, God ruined my plans, Nice, but he improved my life. Nice. So I was a high-tech CEO, sold my business, retired. Um, and I was already stepping into this stuff prior to that having happened. But um, the stereotype for me would be, you know, move to Florida, play golf all the time, have a big boat. And I do have a house in Florida. And I do go down there. But when we go down there, what do we do? Every Wednesday morning, we're serving up in Cape Coral at a homeless ministry. That's what we do. So we're trying to bless them with our time there too, right? So... Um, 
Uh, what was the question, Bill? <laughs> what are some of the things that ways in which you can say God has transformed me What's as a result the, of these years of service. So the, the, the transformation has really taken place term, in terms of my, the way that we spend our money, the way we spend our time. I uh-huh. mean, Carla, who day in and day out runs our, our nonprofit threshold in new life. Um, I mean, every single day of our lives, we're thinking, planning, scheming, serving, praying, planning. Uh, it's, it's a total immersion. And it's something that I, I, wouldn't have planned for myself, didn't see it coming. Uh, but it's just kind of, God's just kind of gently slipped it onto us within the capacity that he's given us to handle it. Mm-hmm. And talk about the threshold to, to new life. That's threshold, the number two, newlife.org. You can learn more about that there. Say more about that. So it's a nonprofit that helps people with housing insecurity in the greater Minneapolis, St. Paul areas, what our geogra- geography is, uh, God uh, willing. It looks like we'll be on pace to help 600 families with either keeping or obtaining their housing this year. And we do that by s- providing small matching grants. We like to say we and we work with the clients to help them solve their problems to try to give them a hand up, not a handout. Mm-hmm. That's really amazing because <laughs> when you lose your housing, you are homeless. You're homeless, yeah. 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 And then I meet them in the evenings. Yeah. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Um, we have time for one 60-second story of some homeless person that has really left an impression on you. A friend of mine, Kirk, met him 10 years ago, served him a bowl of grits on Curry Avenue. Uh, geographic location to try to improve his life, came up here to start to adult, I think, and uh, bumpy road over 10 years that we've known each other up and down. I told him, I said, you got a friend in me, you got a friend for life. And so I've stuck with him the entire way. I uh, talked to him about surrender. And he called it the S word because he didn't want to say it all. I said, I'm not ready to surrender. He said, I'm not ready for the S word yet. That's mm-hmm. what he would tell me. Uh, I was diagnosed with colon rectal cancer in January. Uh, in February, it had metastasized, passed away in September. And during that process, um, God brought him to that place to surrender and we talked about that, and he said, you know, cancer sucks, but he said, if this is a result that it's taken this for me to surrender, oh. he said, I'm good with that. So wow. uh, I performed his funeral for his family, um, and we've talked about him in our nonprofit. Uh, it was a great story. It was a great relationship, a big blessing to me. Oh, that's beautiful. Richard Barr has been my guest. You can learn more about Richard at richardbarrbahr.com. See a couple of his books. One's called Amaze. Why the Humanity of Jesus Matters, and Those People, the True Character of the Homeless. 